Welcome to the third episode of the sixth season of the Ubuntu podcast. It's Wednesday the 27th of March and in this episode we are going to discuss what's been in the news. We'll also be talking about the latest happenings in the Ubuntu community. If you're listening live you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I'm Mark and joining me this week are Tony. Good evening Mark. And Alan. It totally is not the third episode. No, did I say third? <laughs> it's the fifth episode, I think. <laughs> ah, somebody hasn't edited this piece of text. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> somebody. No Laura this week, though. She's off on bigger and more interesting things, apparently, yeah. than being on the podcast. Is it a Doctor Who podcast, by any chance? <laughs> well, you joke. Uh, no, she's at a conference of some sort. Okay. Uh, hopefully she'll be back in time for the next episode, but let's see. <laughs> what, what, next you week? mean, yeah, next yeah. week. I'm sure that it's not that long a conference. Well, we shall see. It depends if we should be in the next episode or not. Wait and find out. <laughs> let's get on with some news. Sounds like a fan fact show. <laughs> First in the news, the Python trademark debacle is settled. So remind us Good. what uh, what was going on there. Oh gosh, someone had a trademark and they wanted to enforce it and use the word Python as a product name in the UK and the Python Foundation didn't like that because they've been using Python in the open source community for a long time and the internet rose up like a giant demon and attacked <laughs> this company who were outrageously using the brand name Python. Hmm. And it's all sorted now. So we can go and fight some other battle. Cool. Yeah, there are some lessons to learn, though, because although the Python Software Foundation had registered the trademark in the US, they hadn't registered it in Europe yeah. or apparently anywhere else in the world. This company were applying to to the European trademark place to register it. So An entirely reasonable thing to do. An entirely reasonable thing to do, yeah. Um, well, except that, you know, there's obviously the potential to, for confusion there. There is, yes. But, you know, if, if I saw something called Python Cloud, I would think, oh, that's running on Python. But if you're a UK-based organisation who has no illusions of being an international player, yeah. you might want to trademark your product name in your region and not be particularly bothered about trademarks in other regions because they don't affect you. Yeah, well, but the fact that it's not a registered trademark doesn't mean it's not a name that's in use. No, but as part of the trademark registration, you find that out, don't you? Well, which they did find out. <laughs> the system <laughs> works. <laughs> they found out in spades. Yeah. Yes. So, so yeah, they've now withdrawn their trademark application and rebranded their Python cloud service. Hmm. So they'll be calling it something else. Pearl Cloud. <laughs> <laughs> Django Cloud. <laughs> I think you find it's Django. Yes, yeah, Django Cloud. Yeah, and apparently they're now going to support the Python Software Foundation in their use of Python as a as a, uh, as a software term. I'm sure their support will be most welcome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're all friends, really. Yes, let's send them some flowers. <laughs> or some Pythons. <laughs> <laughs> in a box. <laughs> Oh. Right, what's next in the news, Tony? There's a story about OpenShot, the Ooh. open source video editor. Have you used OpenShot? I have. It's the thing that I use when I edit video. Ah. Um, so this is quite <laughs> Being interesting Being a video story. editor, that's yeah, probably useful. quite a good use to put it to. Yeah, I tried to use it to edit text files, but it was, uh, it was fairly rubbish at that. Um, yeah, it's the open source video editor, one of several that have existed over the years, but they've kicked off a Kickstarter campaign. And what's the goal? $20,000. To do what? Um, basically, to and you're, you sorry, might... I came across rather aggressively. Oh, do, do what? What? <laughs> what are they going to do with that money, Tony? Um, they are going to uh, rewrite the core engine of OpenShot. This is this is always something that works out well for uh, software projects. Well, it sounds like yeah, they've actually started um, the well, work already. Yeah. They've got quite a bit of the way along. But when, the... I f when I first saw this or read this, I was quite sceptical because I, I know other video editor projects that have said, hmm, all these video libraries we use are a bit shonky, we need to go away and write our own and then disappear into the ether. Right. Um, but reading through the Kickstarter page, it seems that they have actually been working on this for a couple of years and it's nearly ready for prime time and they need a bit of money to push it over I guess for developer time, just to kind of push it over the, the finishing line. Mm. Right. Um, and one of the one of the key things that I've noticed in the Kickstarter, which um, kind of made me cringe a little bit, was that one of the goals is to make it cross-platform. 
Yeah. Yeah. And release a video editor on Windows and on on OS ten. Yeah. Now um, go on. No, it just uh, I don't know. Okay. The developers can choose to be on whatever platforms they want to. It's entirely up to them. But <laughs> given your main selling point when you first started was we're doing a video editor that works on Linux mm. that you know nobody else seems to have managed to do properly, a nice, easy-to-use um, video editor. Yeah. To then and, and not have enough resources to be able to get that to completion because it isn't yet, it still yeah. crashes, it still uh, can't open certain file formats, to then branch out and say, hey, let's go over there where there are already loads of video editors that are really, really good, hmm. and let's try and dominate there as well, I think is misguided. It certainly seems to be a risk of uh, spreading yourself very thin um, to do that. And well, they, and I mean, s- if, they're, if, they're, if they're rewrite uh, is is, you know... Um, cross-platform from the start Mm. so you know they're not having to go through any additional overhead in order to make this cross-platform then maybe there isn't um, uh, an additional amount of develop resource to to go cross-platform yeah but there must be some platform specific stuff yeah and they're relying on all the typical good old video libraries according to the web page it relies on ffmpeg and various yeah Yeah. Um, actually i'm not sure about melt anymore but various other kind of things that are readily available on linux but aren't on Windows by default. Oh, they so, are. Oh, by default. By default. Yeah, yeah, they're not on Linux by default. Uh, okay. <laughs> on, on, you know, you have to have the whole thing of packaging them and bundling them in. Right. Because people running Windows applications expect it to be one binary that you double-click, it yeah. goes through a wizard and installs it. So they have to bundle all these libraries uh, with the product normally. I think that's less of an issue, actually, on uh, on Windows and on the Mac. I think you're that, that's less of a problem because you're not going to have the um, freedom-loving bunch right. who are telling you you can't ship that library you can't ship that codec with that library you can't mix this with that on windows people go yeah whatever it's a download <laughs> i'll put it on my machine i don't really care hmm. um I, I i'm i'm more concerned about the fact that there's they're, they're they're spreading out away from you know making the core thing really excellent yeah the the actual video editor itself really excellent and branching out onto somewhere where there are already dominant players that are pretty excellent well they've already reached thirteen thousand dollars of their twenty thousand um, dollar target and i think there's about a week or so to go so they may well reach that they might do yeah mm. um so then the question is of the people who are giving money are they linux users who want to see a decent open source video editor or are they people who genuinely want to see this ported to windows or mac os mm. which is obviously a question we can't answer but yeah. it's an interesting thing to think I, about. I, I'm just pondering how many people think in the same way. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, and maybe it's a, it's a, a selfish thing to think um, that you know we should have this for Linux and not yeah. bother trying to port to another platform. I can completely understand that perspective, but I'm just wondering how many other people have the same point of view as me and don't donate because of that. Yeah, and mm. the, but also there's uh, Lightworks, isn't there? Which is due to be open sourced or has been open sourced as, now. A, as an yeah, alpha. Yeah, this is a, yeah. Which is a a ti- about. We used to have a timer on the wall that's counting down. <laughs> which will which, which will develop. Uh, sorry, which is will... Lightworks open source yet? Dot com. <laughs> Get on it. But that will deliver an open source video editor for Windows, Mac, and Linux. But that already existed. Yes, I know, but it's being open sourced and is available yeah. as an alpha. Right. I'm not saying to the open shot guys they should stop. I wish them all the luck in the world. I think they should really go ahead and, yeah, and totally. try and do it, deliver their product in the way they want to do it. But you know, we're starting to have uh, a bit of a conflict between those two things. I think mm. it's almost like text editors ten years ago. <laughs> Yeah. We've got so many of them. Mm. Well, beside the, the cross-platformness, um, I'm not really a, a video person, but Tony is. Is there, Are there any, <laughs> are there any other um, no, sort I... of features which they've, they've talked about which are, you know, quite, would be quite cool to have that OpenShot needs? Um, they have, they're integrating rendering and things into it as well. So you can do sort of animated titles and, and that sort of thing. So um, is that not reliant on Blender anymore? I don't know because previously you could. It was quite comprehensive. If you had Blender on your system, you could get OpenShot and specify some settings for where you wanted overlay text and how you wanted to zoom onto, onto the screen, and it would then spawn off right. Blender to render out ah, the series cool. of frames mm. to, to generate that three D um, uh, intro. I, I don't know. Cunning, the yeah. demonstration videos didn't work when I went to their website. Uh, <laughs> so my, my <laughs> sorry, this is the video uh, editor's website. The, yeah, the, the videos didn't work. I think that's probably Flash on it's, Tony's. No, machine. it's Vimeo. It never works. Uh, okay, okay. I, I, 
I have very simple requirements for most video editors in that I start recording and there's loads of fluff at the front and then there's the bit in the middle that I actually want to keep and then there's the bit at the end where I'm moving the mouse around or talking stupidly and stopping the video camera and all I want to do is chop the front and the end off that video and I I had this last week I tried to uh, just top and tail a video mm. and the video editor I happened to use hung while it was rendering out and mm. and that is just like the absolute simplest thing that I want to do. Yep. It's it's like using the the you know the Unix head and tail commands. They are like absolute minimum requirement to like top and tail a file. Yeah. And I, I I just find it incredibly frustrating that the simple stuff doesn't work. I think it's great to have fabulous goals like the um uh, Nova Cut guys have got with yes. you know distributed uh, video editing and mm -hmm. uh, these new uh, user interfaces of ways of editing video. But if you can't get the absolute basics working, no hope. Yeah, give OpenShot a try. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, uh, Mark, what's up? Uh, Chinese R and D companies have partnered with our friends Canonical to produce an operating system for Chinese users. Oh, okay. So is this based on Ubuntu? It is. It's called. Kylin, or if that's how you pronounce it, I'm not. I don't know either. I'm not big on my anglicised Chinese words, um, but yeah. So it, it's. Um, I think it's initially basically going to be a um, a highly localised version of Ubuntu, by the sound of it. So, what sort of things will be different in this from stock Ubuntu? So, for example, um, I don't know if this will be in Kylin, but I know one of the requirements that there are state mandated guidelines on computers in china mm -hmm. um so if you ship a computer that's got an operating system pre-installed there are some things that have to be there so for example if you're shipping to surveillance uh, <laughs> yeah i could see surveillance key loggers yeah. you know all that kind of stuff. all the things that the free software organizations stand for actually the, the only one that i'm aware of is actually an introduction tutorial that's oh, mandated really? yeah. yeah and it's actually something we don't ship on ubuntu in any other region other than China, is a tutorial that takes you through what all the icons mean down the left-hand side and, you know, how you open documents and how you open a browser and stuff like that. And it's because the kind of people that they're selling to in the middle of nowhere of China, yeah. where there are, you know, many millions of people of this demographic, mm. have zero computing experience whatsoever. They live in a village in the middle of nowhere. Exactly the kind of, um, you know, thing you, you've you seen on TV of people mm. living in, out in the... Uh, in the countryside and this is their first computer and they just don't know you know it's, it's all very well us saying the computer is intuitive but you know the absolute first user experience yeah. it's mandated by the government that there's so is this part of um part of a drive to get more of china using computers then um po i don't know Poss I don't, i'm not quite sure what the motivation behind it was but um it seems like they want to have something that is you know, flexible and tailored for their locale. Cool. So and is this going to be bundled with hardware? Well, we already ship um, computers with Ubuntu on yeah. over there. There's hundreds of stores in China that sell Dell computers with um, Ubuntu pre-installed. Yeah. And it is a localized version with the modifications that are mandated for that region. So, um, so it's not a bog-standard install of Ubuntu. So Carlin maybe goes a, a step further and, and provides additional yeah. customizations. Yeah, and and... We, then yeah, there's going to be a, a, a bi-directional communication between the community in China and Canonical and also with the government in mm -hmm. order to um, fulfil whatever their requirements are. And also there's some um, sort of web services which are quite specific to China because obviously certain websites which we're very yeah. familiar with aren't allowed in China, so they have their own sort of equivalent. So um, I think Kylin's going to be integrated with those the way that our Ubuntu might be integrated with Twitter and Facebook and things like yeah, that. Yeah, even like stuff like uh, their their chat thing is um, QQ. Their social thing is called QQ, and mm -hmm. you know nobody uses that. It's and that that happens a lot around the world. In in um, Brazil, there's Orkut, which is a Google product. Yes, yeah, and that's used heavily in Brazil. Nowhere else, mm. you know. And the same in in you know uh, Japan and and China. There's there's very locale specific things and. If there's no point us shipping that stuff in the in the base distro in the English language version because nobody would use it. Mm. Okay, well, interesting to see what comes of that one then. Mm. Next, we have uh, Nokia, who have declared they will not freely license WebM technologies to Google. So last week we spoke about uh, an agreement that WebM had uh, no, what was there? 
MPEG LA mm. had, had struck with Google over licensing uh, or yeah, licensing the web the patents oh, in yes. WebM. Yeah, this all becomes clear again now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so MPEG LA is a consortium of companies who all have a set of patents that cover uh, video encoding and exactly. decoding uh, type things. And so they then broker licensing agreements with people for doing things like um, H.264. I think they do the DVD playback licensing as DVD well. DVD CSS, that's a separate company, I think. Well, they did the MPEG video bit. Yes, yes. yeah. Um, and... Um, yeah, so they basically agreed with Google that Google could distribute WebM uh, even if it um, infringes in patents of MPEG LA members. They're going to stop trying to form a pool of patents to attack them. But in swoops, Nokia. Yes, and says, no, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, you apparently infringe. Well, they, yeah, they're, they're saying that um, WebM infringes 64 of their granted patents and 24 of their um, pending patents, which is sounds awfully familiar to Microsoft's claims over Linux a couple of years ago. Mm. Um, uh, but whether it means they're actually going to, you know, litigate against them or just stand there on the sidelines to put people off adopting WebM remains to be seen. But they their argument was that it's the, um, a a proprietary technology which offers no advantages over exist, existing widely deployed standards even though it's an open source <laughs> uh, only defined I used to really like Nokia yeah before they sold out well you know before they went all rubbish yeah uh, <laughs> at what point did they go rubbish uh, when Stephen Elop joined right. the company basically yeah um, it all went downhill from there really they they made great phones they had loads of um, great phones in the pipeline mm. um, but they completely mismanaged them and missold them and that was a real shame. They were a bit behind the uh, curve on the smartphone market, though, weren't they? Some of them were, but but they, they kind of caught up, and they had loads in development, but then they never shipped them, or they shipped them in such restricted numbers or were in, in very limited regions, like only in Finland, for example, you could buy certain phones. And, you know, there's a giant market over in the, the west of the planet that, <laughs> <laughs> that would quite like to buy some of those phones. And indeed in the east of the planet. Well, yeah, as well, yeah. And now the, some of that hardware... Uh, technology that was in, say, for example, the N9, which is absolutely beautiful phone, a gorgeous piece of equipment and a lovely operating system, is now being seen. That hardware innovation is seen in the Lumia range, mm. which now run Windows Phone. Yeah. In fact, I um, bumped into Andy Piper the other week who had one of those to, to play around with. Yes. Um, it was, you know, it's a phone. Right. Yeah. It's a phone. Right. The, the tiley thing looked quite interesting on a little screen. But then, it, other than that, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not terribly exciting. Such a shame. Yeah. Mm, fair enough. And Forbes have been in the news as well. They've been writing lists. <laughs> and taking they names. twice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and they've named Mark Shuttleworth as one of the most disruptive people. <laughs> in dot, dot, dot. Yeah. <laughs> It says here, in business in 2013, specifically in the area of computing. Um, disruptive in a good way, I assume. Yeah, I would imagine so. But, well, <laughs> in either way, really. He doesn't just run into the room at parties and go, did, ah, I don't throw think, the crisps on the floor. I don't, <laughs> I don't think disruption necessarily implies good, but it, it implies change. Well, people, Yeah, Which people is, talk about yeah. disruptive technologies and, yeah. you know, as a generally positive thing, unless you're part of the old guard, I guess. I kind of feel bad that I don't actually recognise a single other person on the list um, in business. Are they all business. technology people? No, no, they're, they're from every, like, healthcare, media, retail, social oh, media. Okay. There's, there's, there's lots of um, areas, and, you know, you can obviously click through to each one of them and find, find out, out who they are. Who they are, and, you know, there's, there? there's a guy, founder of University Now, who's from San Francisco, and... Um, oh, that is... Well, yeah, I probably exactly. should know that what that is. That sounds like something which I would know. Well. <laughs> and some guy who works for uh, fa- who's the founder of Aereo, A E R E O, in New York. Never Lovely heard of chocolate him. bars they make. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he looks like a nice chap, but no idea who he is. Um, so clearly, I'm at the wrong end of the scale here, <laughs> not knowing who a single one of these. And uh, of the twelve. Um, classes there's one two three four it's 12 classes but in total some of them have got multiple people in so um 
So 16, do you think, 16 people in total. Do you think that most people will uh, be seeing Mark Shuttleworth on that list and having exactly the same reaction to him that you had? Exactly. To, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, these lists are always very important. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's two women on the list out of uh, 16 total. Oh, well, that's uh, mm. good. We're, mm. not, we're not in any position to talk about being representative this evening, unfortunately, no. <laughs> on this show. No. But yes, interesting lists, always good fun. Yes. Right, let's get on with the next bit. <laughs> the Ubuntu podcast needs you. Yes, you. If you hear something that enthralls, exasperates, or elevates you, tweet at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook, and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. Please do get in touch. I mean it. Just one message. Just to know there's someone out there who cares. It's time for the community news. And first up this week, we have a blog post from Matthew Garrett, the angry, angry Matthew Garrett, writing about a secure boot and restric- restricted boot. Yeah, he was. Um, there was a, a conference in Boston, I think it was, over right. the weekend called Libra Planet, um, talking about yeah, openness and and free software and all that kind of good stuff. Mm. And uh, Matthew gave a talk um, about secure boot and restricted boot. And um, it was it was very interesting, and he explained it in a very simple, easy-to-understand way mm-hmm. in typical Matthew style, um, and then had a little Q&A afterwards with uh, some heated discussion <laughs> with members of the audience. Um, and uh, and it was videoed, and uh, we've put the, got the video on, on link from his blog, uh, and it's really worth a watch. If you if all this secure boot, restricted boot stuff sounds a little bit cloudy in your head, then I would watch that video because it's worth watching and it's he it makes it very, very clear. Yeah. Cool. Even the blog post is pretty clear as mm. well. Yeah. So if you can't watch the video for some reason, read the words. There was also an IRC meeting. <laughs> what? Yep. what? That is an item, is it? Yeah, well, it's about... There was a meeting. <laughs> the meeting was of the Ubuntu Technical Board ah. and the Ubuntu Technical Board were reviewing some of their proposals around changes to the upcoming release strategy. So this was talking about, you know, what, how long are things going to be supported for? Will there be a rolling release? Mm-hmm. And so things the, like that. So what was, th- was the conclusion? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the conclusion is there was a meeting. Yeah, you got there, that right. There were three things on the agenda. There were three members out of seven on the technical board in attendance. Right. Which is not great, I guess. Mm. It's quite a small number of people to make some potentially large decisions about the way the Ubuntu release strategy works. But, yeah, well, the good news is that all this stuff has been debated uh, ad <laughs> infinitum for the last preceding month and yes. discussed in public open forums like mailing lists. Uh, so I think all the people, if they were going to object, would have done so by now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there were other people in the meeting who were voicing opinions, but obviously only the technical board members actually have a vote because yes. mm-hmm. they are voted on. Um, so they were looking at reducing the length of support for regular uh, L- non-LTS releases, so that's the things that come out every six months at the moment, yep. reducing that down from 18 months support to nine months support. So mm. that means that you'd have three months after the next release to upgrade to that. Yep. Yeah, which would be big problems for me. Why? Because I never get around to upgrading in time. So don't why then. don't you run LTS? Yeah, well, don't then. Yeah, I do effectively run LTS. <laughs> um, so Supported by you for the long term. Yeah, I roll my own patches. Um, yeah, so LTS releases would stay um, five years support, but it's the idea of this is to reduce the burden on the Ubuntu community and infrastructure and people of packaging all these security updates and things mm. for releases that, you know, hopefully a few people use and help encourage people to move off and move on and move up. So that's going to change from uh, 1304, so from this next release. Yeah, just next month. Yeah. And also they decided that um, as a sort of, you know, a solution to the rolling release idea that um, something should be implemented so that you can be, you, you can basically say, always keep me on the development release. Right. And that means that, um, so you'll be running, say at the moment you'd be running raring, mm. and then when raring is released, you automatically roll over to whatever the next uh, release is called. Yeah, so the, there'll be like monthly cuts, like 1305, 1306, 1307, that kind of thing. No, I think no, it's, I think it's it's just it's like you've got on your laptop at the moment. You can upgrade whenever, right, and you'll so get the latest. You're constantly getting. You constantly packages. get it, and but then when the release happens, you don't then have to say 
don't leave me on raring upgrade right, me. It just says it just says, Oh, you want to always have the latest thing, so, so keep like your the gun Debian testing. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. 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 So exactly. you're constantly getting the next stuff up. You don't mm. have to do anything. Which I think is a really good idea. Yeah. And it's just a case of a few sim links effectively. Yeah. And managing those whenever there's a new release. <laughs> Yeah, you, tell, you can tell Colin Watson that his job is just a bunch of sim links. No, not his, <laughs> not his whole job, but it is, that bit of it. That bit of it is, is a relatively simple thing to implement. <laughs> Off you go then. <laughs> yeah, you tell him that. <laughs> oh dear, that's not what I meant. Um, they briefly also discussed some changes to the update tool to allow users to upgrade by more than a single release at a time. Oh, I missed that bit. So to jump. Um, from twelve ten, mm. oh, for so example. If you do, if you do the, the uh, nine month support and you've uh, and you've let, it, let it lapse, you can skip that one and go to the yep. the next over that. So twelve ten, thirteen ten, or even fourteen oh four. Oh, that'd be good. Yeah. So there's some interesting decisions. I think all the, all, all the right ones, in mm. in my humble opinion. Good. Cool. Um, and a bug in Fedora's bug tracker meant that Fedora bugs couldn't be tracked. <laughs> Someone should find a bug about that. Oh. Hey. <laughs> So this was because the, the the code name for Fedora 18 is Schrodinger's cat. Yes, which has an umlaut over the O and an apostrophe after the R. Ah, <laughs> yeah, both of them together are right. um, are a pain. Um, it's a good job they didn't name it Schrodinger's drop tables. <laughs> <laughs> so I I I, uh, I saw people. Um, mention this on google plus and various places and be quite confident that oh, this wouldn't this wouldn't affect us yeah uh, in 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 uh, ubuntu land and i thought well that's quite bold I, i'm not sure i would did make you, that did assertion. you file a bug no with I, the title showed against cat no i went bet one better than that i created a project called uh schrodinger's um siamese uh, ah, and uh, i did see that mentioned right yeah so i created a project called schrodinger's siamese and that was okay yeah. Um, and uh, then I started creating, you know, more elements within Launchpad to, to build up an entire project to find out at what point it would break. Um, I was using the staging instance of Launchpad, not right. the live, okay. <laughs> just in case I broke it. And I did find at least one. Uh, okay. I stopped when I found one, just to prove my point that <laughs> ours isn't. You know, we could be bitten by this if Mark decided yeah. that the S release in six months is going to be Schrodinger's Siamese, which I think it should be. <laughs> There's a there's a town in uh, in the Netherlands, I believe, where uh, which is really good to use in test data for addresses because its name begins with an apostrophe. <laughs> excellent. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. I think there's a bug in Launchpad that stops any of my bugs getting resolved. <laughs> I think I found that. No, that's just you. <laughs> okay. And we've got a few events. Yeah, yes. the first one being Digital Freedom, uh, sorry, being the Culture Freedom Day, the second Culture Freedom Day, supported by the Digital Freedom Foundation. It's going to be on the 18th of May, and it's a day for celebrating free culture. You can register for more information and potentially even get a support pack at culturefreedomday.org. That's interesting, because there's Software Freedom Day in September, mm. and today, I think, is Document Freedom Day, isn't it? Uh, yes, I think I saw something about that. Yes. Simon Phipps put something on Google+. I, I saw it on Google+, Plus about 3 o'clock this afternoon, <laughs> and I pointed out that the, the website says that they are uh, advocacy and raising awareness of uh, Document Freedom Day, and I said they'd done a pretty bad job if I didn't find out until 3 o'clock in the afternoon on maybe the Maybe it was in America. <laughs> yeah, maybe. You did find out, that's the point. Uh, <laughs> the Institute of Engineering Technology are writing a Raspberry Pi GPIO workshop at Southern University in Southampton on the 12th of April, and it's free. This is learning how to use all of the input output pins on your Raspberry Pi. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Better than just booting up Debian yeah. and <laughs> you running with... XBMC on your telly. Exactly, yeah. yes. Yeah. And turning it off again. <laughs> and finally, Ohio Linux Fest is looking for talks for their 2013 event, which will be held in September 13th to the 15th in Columbus, Ohio. They're looking for a variety of talks at all levels, from beginners through intermediate and advanced. Any topic relating to free and open source software to open hardware is fair game for a talk. Just go to ohiolinux.org slash CFP and fill out the submission form. Cool. That's all for this episode. Thank you for listening and join us next time when we'll be interviewing Benjamin Carenza from the Open Photo Project, going over your feedback and having some command line love. Yeah. 
No. Yeah. No, GUI love. No, I'm pretty sure it's command line love. Is it? Yeah, unless you've changed it, no, it's command line love. Is it? Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> I love how confident we are in our own segments here. <laughs> uh, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.